before I, I want to continue with the topic tonight, very short to answer some questions as good as I can. <laughs> For instance, there are some questions only the Lord knows. Um, this one, for instance, is Ariel Sharon still alive? And if so, where is he? <laughs> <laughs> there are a few Israelis who know where he is. Um, is he still alive? We think. But... Uh, Nobody knows really what is going on. Most no, think that he's still in a coma. And um, unfortunately, we believe that he's um, somehow still holding the coma because his party doesn't want to lose um, his authority because without him, uh, Kadima would lose a lot of support and authority. And, um, well, there are a lot of rumors. Some believe that God is going to raise him from the dead. I would wish for him that it will be so, that he may um, receive the Lord. But uh, you can pray for him, where, whatever condition he is in. But most of us in Israel don't know where he is. So he's kept with his family and his party uh, in a hidden place to protect him, they say. So uh, another question, what is our worldly threat as Christian, secular humanism or Islam? Or will they work together? I try to explain that, that they are working together because at the end is the same spirit working through both of them. The spirit which is just denying the lordship of Yeshua and does not want to submit um, to the authority of God. And I would say both are deep threat. And sometimes I think humanism is the, actually the more serious threat to the West than Islam. Because Islam is violent, Islam we understand that we are threatened by but humanism has much, much more actually uh, taking, has actually getting hold of the church and of the believers in our thinking, in our way to approach things. You have only to look into, we have to look into our own life. What we are driven by in our daily life, is it really the authority of the Word of God, or is it what is acceptable in society? When I think, for instance, a very simple thing, I have seen that again and again in a lot of different um, believing churches. For instance, how we deal with the whole issue of, of relationship, marriage, it's so acceptable today that um, young people, without being challenged, can live together and still being part of everything in the church. Uh, and um, the fact is that in the Christian um, world, the divorce rate is as high as in the world. And if this does not talk uh, really 
business how much humanism is threatening the church. And why? Because divorce, it's acceptable. Everybody does it. Sure, there are a lot of different reasons why. And I don't want to start to judge, but the fact is, if this is as high as in the world, then uh, the question is, um, where is the difference? Where do we, in the church, teach about, not only about the holiness of marriage and the order in the family, the, the God-given order in the family, and who, which pastor would dare today to talk about the place of the man and of the woman in marriage and family? Most of us would not. I have seen few churches who from the pulpit they would say that's what God thinks about marriage. Why? Because we are afraid to be put in a, park, in a box, to be called narrow-minded, to be called people from yesterday, to be called people who are against liberty of women and men. And, and I don't speak only about um, things co um, related to women, but also men. I mean, there are so few men who dare to take their position. And I mean to take their position to understand what God requires from a man. Friends, if we would understand that, what he requires, then uh, we would uh, have a deep fear of God because uh, position of a man is um, unbelievably challenging in the eyes of God. If he says that man should love his wife like Christ loved the church. I mean, means to give his life. And the other thing, the challenging thing, that uh, the place of uh, the wife. I have seen few churches who dare to talk about that, even it's so key for the kingdom of God. Why don't we talk about that? We are afraid to be seen as narrow-minded people who are not really um, acceptable to the society. So humanism is driving us in a lot of things we do and we don't do. To all of us, our individual liberty is so important. We watch over our own rights to do what we want to do. And that's not biblical thinking. That's humanism. Friends, if I would go into this topic, we would be very surprised to see how deep our thinking actually is humanistic thinking in our approaches to life, our understanding of things. So I think humanism is the much, much deeper threat because it comes in silent, slowly, and acceptable. It's because uh, we all want to be acceptable to the world, to be understood, not to be seen as foolish. You know, people who don't understand the, the changes who want to be, who want to, uh, let's, uh, at the end, be reasonable. And, um, but the fact is, the kingdom of God is not reasonable. <coughs> the kingdom of God will always be a deep challenge and a threat to the world. And um, we all know how soon we back off when the world say, you are a Christian and uh, 
then they start to say, where do you take, um, where do you take the authority and the liberty to judge? They always then start to say, you are judging. And we don't want to be people who judge. We don't want to be people who cause conflicts. We don't want to, people who, to be people who uh, anyhow, again, are seen as those who just um, how can I say no one wants to be an outsider but the fact is the ecclesia who is called out is an outsider in the world because Yeshua says in the world but not from the world Be, let's be honest to our neighbors we want to be we want to appear to be nice people people who are well liked if to be nice is our calling if to be nice it's enough we are not called to be nice we are called actually to love God with all our hearts and to live a life which is challenging to ourselves but also to the world in honesty, in purity, the way how we handle, for instance, our money. Are we different than the world? The way we conduct our business, we invest our money, we deal with our money we will see that we are deeply infected by humanism. Humanism means that man is the measure and the center of all what he does. Humanism puts always the need of man in the center and not the honor of God. And if we realize that we put our needs first, that they will be met, then we have to uh, realize that we are under the spirit of humanism but not under the authority of God because in the word of God God is the first his actually that's what the Lord has taught us to pray hallowed be your name is the first thing we say and here we have to um, To be honest to ourself, is this my daily desire and struggle and do I really, as Paul says, it's only one thing I'm after and this is to be found in him, no matter what the world around me think. And I could go on not only concerning money, concerning our relationship our goals for our own life, <laughs> what I'm heading for, what I would say the most important in my life, what I do invest all my time and all that, we will see a big part of it, it's not different than the world. It's not different and that's humanism because I put myself in the center. So I think humanism behaving like everybody else not to be too different not to be singled out this means driven by the spirit of humanism that's why humanism it's much a stronger threat to us than Islam so Maybe another time we can go deeper into that. But just to give you a taste, here is much more challenge for us. Um, somebody asks, did you ever visit Algeria? I travel now for many years. I didn't visit Algeria. On the other hand, I'm very in touch with 
Algerians who work in Algeria, in Marseille, we are our work in Marseille. Um, they are in touch with underground churches in Algeria itself and other places in Algeria. We support them, we try to help with teaching and you wouldn't believe in Algeria there's an underground church uh, of uh, former Muslims who do not only love the Lord but they pray every week for Israel. They have never been to Israel but the Lord has revealed to them because they love him, his plans. And they tell us how they pray for Israel. And in fact, we are working also with two former Algerian Muslims. One of them, we are just now helping him to um, actually plant an, a church in Marseille among um, North Africans and another one who is a kind of an apostle to Algeria is also one we as a ministry we not only support him but we work together with him we just had a conference a few weeks ago with the two of them in Switzerland and it's unbelievable what God does in the midst of the persecution in Algeria among these people people are coming to the Lord every day in Algeria. Even they are threatened to be imprisoned, to lose their families, but they come to the Lord because the Lord is bringing in a harvest in this nation. Why? Because there were people who have given their life 100 years ago, invested, and they haven't seen anything. I know people they have worked for 40 years 50 years in Algeria, they have not seen one single man coming to the Lord, but they have given their life, and the Lord does never, never forget or forsake what we invest in his name out of love for him. So they have sown without seeing anything. Today, other people are harvesting what other people have sown. That's what the Lord says. Some do so, others do harvest, and he is the one who gives the reward. So, um, God really does something in Algeria in spite of all what is happening there. There's quite a, uh, maybe you have read about that, um, a persecution going on. And um, something interesting for those who are maybe connected to that because somebody must relate to Algeria. If I read here the question, um, something what God started to do in Algeria is more and more, not the multitude, but it can become a multitude, more and more are starting to discover that the roots of Algeria are not Islamic. Actually, the roots of Algeria. Uh, I don't know, those who know a little bit church history uh, know about Augustine. Augustine was an Algerian. He actually um, was born and was a bishop in a city which today is called Anaba in Algeria. Um, and uh, so other church fathers, by the way, too, Tertullian, those who know him, it's a, an important church father. He was from Tunisia. So they discovered that actually before Islam invaded North Africa, North Africa was Christian. So they want to go back to their Christian roots. May God push this vision deeper and really turn whole, whole North Africa back. Uh, this Algerian, Ahmed Tsawi, unfortunately I don't know him. It's a political ref refugee here in New Zealand. I don't know him and uh, how you can pray for him. <laughs> I think 
the Holy Spirit will show you how to do that. He's good in that. And I think protection, I'm not sure if he's yet a believer or not. I can't read that out of the question. If he's not a believer, then the most important thing is pray that God will give revelation to this man. And in the same time for protection. Something very important. Pray for the Algerian believers that God will give them a boldness really to um, witness Yeshua and in the same time we pray for protection because when they witness and they do witness Yeshua to their own people that's they don't face only some um, you know um, embarrassing gesture from people or embarrassing question, they face really threat, concrete. It means not only their work or jobs are going to be taken from them, but their family are concretely threatened. So, um, so far to Algeria. And um, do you believe the Antichrist is alive? Um, and uh, work may be I don't know. Uh, here, here it's something about DVD backed up the, the word of God. Um, ah, okay. There must be some DVD who names this the Antichrist as a prince in Jordan under the present um, king of Jordan. If I understand this question well, first of all, I don't know. I have no idea and um, we have to be careful in, in this. It could be. We, n we never know. But it's not important. We shouldn't look out for the Antichrist. We should invest all what we have to save souls before he comes, whenever he comes. And we shouldn't be scared by the Antichrist. We shouldn't be because um, the Lord told us, as I said this morning, very clear how we can overcome him. And he said, you will overcome him if you hold that only the blood of the Lamb saves the world. And if we have a testimony if we know who Yeshua is and if we remember the word of Yeshua who said, who asked the disciple, what do you say who I am? And the world is going to ask us. And is the Antichrist going to appear and start to influence the world? The question will always be, what do you say who Yeshua is? And here, the word of our testimony will be important, that we know who Yeshua is. Because this is another tool to overcome the enemy. And giving this testimony, knowing that we are not afraid if our life can be taken away, as Yeshua says, don't fear those who only going to take your body but not, cannot take your soul. And um, the Antichrist is only going to scare those who are afraid for their life. Again. And if we make sure that our heart does really know the, the Lord and that we are not afraid, 
really not afraid to give away our life if it's needed, then there's no reason to be scared. Whenever the Antichrist comes, we're going to continue to do what we are called to do, and this is to preach the gospel. But this we should do. And um, so, wherever he comes from, Jordan, England, America, New Zealand, or even Jerusalem, we're going to leave that to the Lord. Oh, there are many theories. I know them. I have my own. But I, I'm not going to share with you because it's not important. That's not what we want to focus on. So, um, there are more questions, but um, that's enough for now. I would like to continue with um, what I started this afternoon. This afternoon I tried to explain how Islam actually, actually started to influence the West and started even to change the thinking in the Western world, Europe, or even in the Christian world. And the influence of Islam is actually not only targeting those who don't know Yeshua, but also the church. And I would like to focus a little bit on that today, uh, tonight. Friends, Islam did realize something. Islam realized the terror on one hand had the effect that the, that the West started really to bow and to make concession to Islam on one hand. But on the other hand, the Muslims realized that jihad has to be done on different levels not only by violence, by force. There's another very important level which they started against the church. And this is not primarily violence. That's another thing. They realized we have to do, we have to convince, on the other hand, the church and the world that Islam is really a religion of peace. How are we going to do that? Now, after the world has realized there is a deep conflict between Islam and Christianity, or a conflict between Islam and the Western world, they are afraid of Islam, and they all know that peace is actually in deep danger. What are we going to do? And Islam wanted to find another way, actually, to expand in the Western world. And so, after the Pope, some of you remember him maybe, that two years ago, he made a statement which caused a lot of trouble in the Islamic world. Actually, it was even not a statement, it was only a quote. He quoted something, you know that from history. And this coding he did was very simply uh, in a correspondence between a, a Pitzenton um, ruler and the Islamic scholar where the, uh, this ruler said, I don't see any advantage in Islam because Islam is brutal, Muhammad did not bring anything new, then actually violence. And so the Muslim world felt very offended by what the Pope said, and uh, actually the reaction in the Islamic world was exactly the proof for the quote, because all over uh, churches were burned, 
even a Christian were murdered as a reaction because the Muslim world felt offended by the Pope. And the result of that was that after maybe eight months or a year, the, um, some Muslim scholar, I wrote that in that little booklet, the whole thing, some Muslim scholar actually came together and they issued uh, a letter to the Pope and said, listen, you have no idea about Islam, but we are willing to forgive that, and more than that, we are willing actually to have a dialogue with you about our common goals. And they said, and th this is very understandable because we have to understand the strategy behind that. They said, listen, we should sit down because it's very key and important for the world. Because Muslim and Christian together are more than half of the world population. And so it's up to us if there will be peace in the world or not. If we can coexist together, then we can provide peace for the world. It sounds, this sounds very tempting. It sounds very logic and reasonable. So they said, could you sit down with us? And all credit for the Pope, the Pope was very reluctant to do that. He's not a fool. And he knew what they were after. And then a few months later they issued a letter not to the Pope but to the Christian leaders in the non-Catholic world. Among them, free church leaders, actually to the Protestant world. And in that letter, they also said, listen, let's sit together and have a dialogue together. Let's explore ways of peace, how we can coexist, how we can respect each other, how we can um, really find a way of peace for the world because it's up to us. Uh, if we have peace together, then the world will have peace. As soon as they issued the letter, the world immediately started to push pressure on Christian leaders. And they, that's it. It's actually only a question of peace between the religion. If you have peace together, then we will have peace on the earth. So there were polit politicians and world leaders who started to put pressure on uh, church leaders and said, listen, you have a chance now really to force the peace. And you should sit together with the Muslims. Because you always speak about peace, you Christian. Now prove that you really mean what you say. The Muslims offer you an opportunity to make peace. And then the reaction of the Christians at the university in Yale, they worked on an answer. You can read that all in that booklet uh, I have wrote. And the answer actually was for me very, very disappointing, especially when I saw names of even friends of, of mine and other um, leaders I know who have signed this paper. You know, I personally would sit down with every Muslim who wants to dialogue. That's not the problem. I would sit down with every man, no matter where he comes from, what background he has, to talk to him. That's not a problem. To be invited to, to a dialogue, that's not a problem. We should always take advantage of every situation if we are invited. The problem is another thing. In the letter which 
was written by the Christian leader and signed and sent to the Muslim. This was not actually a yes, let's sit down and talk together, but it was already a very big step to make concession, to compromise, and in my understanding, even already a start to submission. Why? Because if you read the letter, it's still in the internet, I think, then you will see in the letter the Christian wrote, they avoided to mention ever everything which is crucial for the gospel. Everything which is an offense to Muslims, like the cross, Jesus is the Redeemer. They spoke about Jesus, they spoke about Jesus, but in a way which every Muslim could accept. Because the Muslims also believe that Jesus is a prophet. Not only that, but they, to accommodate the Muslims, they even started to compare Jesus with Muhammad. Things like, you know, we are so thankful for your offer to peace. Yes, we have more in common than differences. Things like that. The most fundamental thing we have in common, because the letter who was written by the Muslim was very carefully and very, very clever written. The Muslim said we have the same God, we worship the same God, and we have the same commandment, you shall love your neighbor like yourself. First of all, that's a lie. That's a lie because in Muslim understanding, your neighbor is only the Muslim, but not the non-Muslim. So they, they speak in two different understandings and languages. And the Muslim letter was so written and even carefully written and it starts, that's why the, um, the title is A Word Between You and Us. It's taken from a specific a scripture in the Quran which actually speaks about the relationship between Muslim and non-Muslim and calls for submission of the non-Muslim to Islam. And they say, we all believe in one God who has no associate. That's in the letter the Muslim wrote. And everyone who knows and understands Islam or the Islamic world knows what this means. It means we all believe in one God except for Jesus. No associate, it means that Jesus cannot be God. Because in Islamic thinking, the, actually the worst sin you can commit is to add somebody to God. It means Jesus is seen as an addition to God. And so this is the worst thing a Muslim can do to say that Jesus is the Son of God because then you believe in different gods and God is not one. So the Muslim said, we believe in one God who have no associate. It means we believe in one God except that Jesus is not the Son of God. And the Christian leaders did not answer that. They said, yes, we believe in one God. We believe in the same God, and we have the same commandment, love your neighbor like yourself. And then they went on to say, you know, and as Muhammad, this is um, a story out of the Islamic tradition, as Muhammad actually once forgave a man who offended him. So did Jesus at the end of his life forgave those who actually persecuted him. 
So we both believe in forgiveness. If you read the, this letter, then you see how, first of all, on the earth can you compare Muhammad with Jesus? To put him on the same level is a message for the Muslim because they say, and they even, in the Christian letter, they speak about the prophet Muhammad. To call him a prophet, it's strengthening and underlining the understanding in the Islamic world that the Christian leaders believe also that Muhammad is a prophet. And if he is a prophet, then what he says has godly authority. So the Christian leaders actually, they admit that Muhammad is a prophet, and they compare him with Jesus. Actually, the, the main the fundament of Christianity. And the other uh, message in it is actually that when you say Jesus at the end of his life forgave his, um, the people who persecuted him, it's in different way deceiving and a lie. Because first of all, Jesus did not live to the end of his life. He did not get 70 or 80 and then he died and forgave those who offended him. If you say that, you put him like Muhammad who at the end of his life, something happened to him. Jesus died in the midst of his life and he died because he gave his life to redeem the world. And he did not forgive those who offended him because he was personally offended. He prayed for those who said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do because they actually, what humanity did to him, the Romans, the Jews, all who are involved, what they did was actually against God himself. Jesus was not offended personally. And here there were, but they know for the Muslims they can accept that. And so, what happens here is, first of all, the desire for peace. The desire to find a way how to relate to the Muslims. I think some of these leaders, they signed this letter without really understanding what Islam is. Some of them, they look or consider Islam some, somehow as a religion, as another culture, where you, if you find the right way, you can really uh, communicate with the people. They don't see the spiritual reality behind it. That's what I, I believe. I just two weeks ago had a, a very um, long and hard discussion with one who signed it, this letter a very well-known leader in the Christian world and we did deeply disagree together because he said, you know, Marcel, we have to be careful because, you know, when we look at the violence of the Muslims, when we look at Islam, we have to be careful because we as Christians, you know, if we look at our own history, you know, there are so many um, there's so much suffering, there's so much violence in our own history. Where is the difference? There's, no, there's no, not a big difference, and that's why we have to be careful and we have to find a way somehow really to dialogue. This man, he believes in Jesus, he loves Jesus, it's no doubt. That's uh, not the question. But the understanding is this, I told him, I agree with you, 100%. But in doing what we did in church history was misusing the gospel. You cannot, you cannot at all justify any violence with the word of God. You cannot. But in doing what Islam did, that's actually what the Quran requires. They're two different things. One thing is misuse of the gospel and the other thing is fulfilling what actually um, God in the Quran tells his 
followers to, to do. And we have to be very careful that we are not going to take our own failures and sins as Christian and make them ex an excuse to bring, uh, actually to make the gospel similar to Islam. This friends actually don't understand the strategy behind this approach. Because the Islamic world, they realized we have to do something to paralyze the Christian world. How can we do that? We are not going to do that mainly through violence, but jihad has to be done through dialogue to hug them and embrace them in a way that they will not be able really to offend us anymore. Because the Islamic world knows the pressure on the Christian to do something for peace. Because the world is afraid of violence. And so they offer now a way how we can do peace. But the Muslims say if we sit together, if you want to have a coexistence, then let's understand. If you respect us, friends, you have to show that you respect us. If you believe that we are religion who have most in common, even there are some little differences, but we have most in common if you respect us, if you say that Islam is a respectable religion, then express that, please, in telling your people that Islam is a religion of peace. And we also going to respect Christianity in the West. We're going to respect you, and, but going on, we will come back to the same, uh, to the same things they will say. But there are a few things who are bothering us. If you are respecting us, then to the Christian, then make sure that you will not continue to do mission among Muslims. Because if you do that, then this is double talk. If you really respect us, if you want to coexist, to coexist with us, then don't send missionary to turn our people into Christian. Otherwise, you do not really respect us. You do not regard us as a partner for peace. And the second thing will be, if you respect us, then please be careful how you relate to our arch enemy to Israel, because the Israelis, they will not say the Jews. They will say only the Israelis, because they cannot, towards the Christian officially, say we have something against the Jews. Because they will make a big difference between the Jews and Israel. Because they know it's, it's not politically correct to be against the Jews, because that's a religion. But Israel is a state secular state, then we can say this state of Israel is uh, committing war crimes against Arabs, war crimes against Palestinians. How can you continue to support this, this state and this nation who are persecuting our uh, people, the Muslims in Palestine? If you want really to have peace with us, to have real dialogue with us, prove it in taking some distance vis-a-vis -vis Israel. You have to start to balance your um, relationships. And a big part of the church is already starting to do that. Why? Because the Muslim world offers peace in return to 
forsaking or at least in return to backing off from Israel. And it's amazing that most of those who signed this letter uh, to the Muslims, at least those I know, most of them are very reluctant towards what the state of Israel, what Israel does. Because they see, well, they may even say, well, Israel, okay, they may still be the people of God. They may still be the people of the covenant and the chosen people, but not in that condition. The way they behave today is so unjust that they cannot really uh, um, say that they are now in the will of God. So we have to correct them, we have to confront them, and that's what the Muslim world says. This whole initiative is aimed on one hand to bring a deep rift between Israel and the church and even the believing church and in the same time actually to paralyze mission into the Muslim world. For instance, in all this dialogue as much as I have was able to follow this, no one of the church leaders did question the attitude and the behavior of the Muslim towards the Christian living in Muslim nations. Because as soon as you come up with that, the Muslim leader would say, you know, we are sorry, but in our nation we have other laws. You know, you don't understand that. You have, first of all, to relate to the laws you have here. You are a democracy, in New Zealand, you are a democracy in England, and you have to deal according to your own laws. A according to your laws, you have to give rights, you have to give freedom, you have to do that and that. But in our nations, we have different laws. And please stay out of our internal affairs. For instance, in Egypt. This um, last December, uh, November, December, during Ramadan in Egypt, three Christians who opened up the restaurant during Ramadan, and in Egypt there's no law who forbid to open a restaurant during Ramadan. They opened the restaurant as they did always, so the police came, they destroyed the restaurant, they broke the bones of these three Christians, and they were taken to prison, and they were condemned for three years of hard labor in prison for opening a restaurant. Even there's no law against it. That's only one thing in Egypt, day by day, Christian, the Coptic Christian, are persecuted. And the state, they know that. You can, in, a, in Egypt, not. There's no nation where you just can build a church. In Saudi Arabia, you're even not allowed to read the Bible at home, if they know. Everything you do, secret. And here, the King Abdullah from Saudi Arabia, just uh, I think six weeks ago or two months ago, was speaking before the UN and the world leaders and church leaders about peace among religion. He is seen right now as one of the hopes to bring forth peace among religion. And he spoke about co coexistence, about accepting each other, that we have to stand together to fight, to fight extremism on all um, places in all religions, and he means 
extremism is when Christians are preaching the gospel to Muslims and in doing that saying there's no other way than Jesus. This is extremism. And the Western world says, yes, that's true. We have to be tolerant. We cannot accept that any religion keeps all the truth. The man, King Abdullah from Saudi Arabia, he can give the speeches and um, the general secretary from the UN, Moon, he was so impressed, even Paris was very impressed by King Abdullah. And uh, they treated him as the voice of peace. Nobody asked, what is going on in your own country concerning non-Muslims? Nobody dares to ask that. Because he would say, excuse me, you don't, you don't uh, involve yourself in our eternal affairs. I mean, that's embarrassing. So the whole initiative is aimed only on the presence of Muslims in the West. How can we bring a coexistence between Christian and Muslims and make a safe place for Islam actually to expand in the West? And how can the church help to bring peace in making Islam acceptable and understandable to the Western world? You would not believe in Europe there are different churches who donated to build mosques. For instance, in Holland, even in Germany, also in England. Most of you who know a little bit about England, you know about the Archbishop of Canterbury, who actually asked the government to make sure he a part of the law. How can a church leader I thought this man must be insane. Either he doesn't know Islam. I mean, to bring Sharia, to make Sharia part of the law, it means not only that everyone who becomes, who converts from Islam to Christianity will be put on the penalty of death, but many things in the Sharia if you would know what Sharia requires, it's unbelievable. And this man said, let's make Sharia part of the law. By the way, it's not only England. Just four weeks ago, a professor in Switzerland um, asked the same thing in Switzerland. Can we make Sharia part of the Swiss law for the Muslims? Why he understood and he said, listen, we cannot integrate Muslims into our society. They are just not able to integrate. So we have to create a parallel society for them. And to give them their own law, for instance, something which is already working today is in Holland, in uh, Sweden, even in Denmark, and I heard even in England, and that polygamy is allowed for Muslims. Polygamy which in Europe, in most of the states, are actually, uh, I think you get seven or eight years prison if you live in polygamy officially. But for a Muslim it's different because they say if a Muslim um, marry under another law, under an Islamic law, then this is a religious thing. And as we cannot question um, the, there is a freedom of religion, we cannot question their belief, so we can also not question actually uh, polygamy, because this is an Islamic expression. So it happens that in Holland, and I think also in Germany and other places, Muslim, they merit in an Islamic country. 
and came back and brought with them their wives, and the state supported all of the wives because it's in a religious expression. Happens today. The same thing is actually starting to develop even in Switzerland. This professor, fair enough, said, listen, we don't want to be hypocrites, he said, because in fact we have already Islamic courts working in the shadow, he said. Most of the Muslims concerning civil rights, marriage, whatever, they don't go to the normal um, judges, they go to Muslim judges. And they do among themselves, and we just look away, he said. Just make it official, he said, because it's already working in Europe. It's already working that Islam has established its own system. So, and now, with this initiative, the Muslims are pushing and wanting to make the church their partner to say, dialogue, coexistence means that you accept us as we are here in Europe. I don't want to <laughs> scare you, but I think the most important thing for me in this context is, friends, the deception which is growing in the church it's unbelievable, and the root of deception are, on one hand, fear, and the second is the desire somehow to solve conflicts. The desire not to live under this challenge and tension that our message is a conflict-creating message, because Yeshua said, I did not come to bring peace. The peace the world is waiting for. He said, I did come to bring the sword, and here he means his word, which is dividing between light and darkness, lies and truth. And because of that, and the world says to the Christian, make peace, the peace we want, the peace, it means the no conflict, and we are so tempted under this pressure to give in. First of all, because we don't want to be un understood by the world. We don't want to be considered as narrow-minded, extremists, fundamentalists. You know, the world is putting really believing Christian into the same pot as Osama bin Laden. I know from the States leaders, world leaders and even Christian leaders who consider missionary or really believing Christian who hold on that there's no other way than Yeshua. They put them in the same box like Osama bin Laden and I heard even uh, world leaders saying they are more dangerous, this Christian even, than this Muslim terrorists. Why? Because, and they understood something, those who really believe that there's no other way, they will always cause conflicts. Because the Muslim extremists, one day they be satisfied when they get more and more actually influence. And they will stop to create conflicts but those who believe there's no other way than Yeshua, they will never stop to do that because we are not looking to be satisfied. We want to win souls for the kingdom. And so they say they are more dangerous. By the way, it's not only world leaders. I just am reminded of our own um, leaders in Israel. Uh, one chief rabbi in Beersheba um, 
a year ago on a rally where there was a persecution on Messianic Jews in that city, in Besheva, he stood up and said, and by the way, those who know a little bit politics, he is the brother of Arya Deri, Yehuda Deri. He stood up and he said, the Messianic believers are for us worse than the Hamas. He said they are worse because what they do is they are changing our Jewish heart, our identity. They're poisoning our thinking. And he said, actually, we consider them worse enemy than Hamas. You can believe that? And something he understood, something is true about it. <laughs> Friends, first of all, the question is, how can we relate to that? First of all, pray for the church leaders. Pray that God will open their eyes and they will see and understand what deception is. Because we are not aiming for a peace, to bring peace to the world which is avoiding conflicts. Yeshua came to save our eternal soul. We all agree on that. He came to save us, not to make the world better. This world will never get better. Unfortunately, that's why Yeshua came to save us out of this world. Because he said there will be one day a new heaven and a new earth. We want to invest everything that people will really meet the one who gives life and who gives real peace. Peace which nobody can take away from us. And Pray for the leaders that God will give them courage to stand against the pressure. And it takes a lot if leaders are responsible and they are pressured by the world and they to say no. There are a line we are not going to cross. We will never say that there is another way than Yeshua. And the other thing is pray for the church, for us all, that God will give us courage to stand up. There's only one way to defeat Islam, and this is by winning Muslim to Jesus. There's no other way that God will give us a deep compassion for Muslims and a deep passion to reach out to them. No matter what it takes, but to let them know, even if they come with violence, with hatred, that they may experience among us that we are not afraid to take the heat for what we believe, and that we want to approach them, not to tell them, first of all, you know, um, Islam is from the devil, Islam is a lie, and that's not our message. Our message is Jesus loves you. He came to give his life for you. Do you know that God cares for you? Do you know that God actually is your father and you can really have life in Yeshua? God does not hate the Muslims. Yeshua does not hate them. He wants them to be saved. And to have the courage as a church really to preach the gospel to them. With all our heart, knowing that they are the enemies of the gospel, knowing they are the enemies of the church, to know that God loved us when we were his enemies. To wait until the Muslims are nice and inviting us to hear, friends, we will go nowhere. Because Yeshua came to seek those who are lost. 
but to pray that we will wake up. That we will wake up and have the courage really to reach out to them, to share with them. Even they would reject us, threaten us. Nevertheless, that's nothing new. You would not be here, we all would not be here today if not before us other people gave their life to preach Yeshua. And thousands and thousands gave their life that the gospel would continue to be preached. And I think we are today in a very challenging way. And I think sometimes God allows even this invasion of Islam into the Western world that the church may stand up and preach the gospel. Because there are few who went into the Muslim world really to preach the gospel. Thank God there are some. But compared to the 1.5 million people are still very few. And so maybe God just allowed this invasion of Islam that at our own doorsteps we realize there is a need. God wants us to tell these people that he loves them. You know, Saudi Arabia is not, does not belong to Islam. Arabia belongs to Yeshua. Iran belongs to him because his God said, I will give you the end of the earth as your inheritance. Did we ever think about Saudi Arabia as a place where Yeshua wants to be worshipped. By the way, concerning Arabs, um, yeah, I'm going to go 10 more minutes. <laughs> Do you know that um, according to the word of God, it looks like the Arabs have even a special place. If we read, for instance, Isaiah 60. In Isaiah 60, all of you know the first scripture, Arise and Shine. <laughs> it speaks about the time where the Messiah is going to reign over Jerusalem as the Messiah, as the King, because your glory has come. And then, when you read through Isaiah 60, you will see that the nations start to gather to Jerusalem to bring their richness to worship the Messiah. And then, you will see those who are leading this procession of the nation to worship the Messiah in Jerusalem, you will see there Midian, Nebaiot, Kedar, all the names written there. Nebaiot is the first son of Ishmael. Kedar is the second son of Ishmael. Midian is an Arab tribe. So those who are mentioned here actually are all descendants of Ishmael or all Arab tribes. And it's amazing that God wanted them through the prophet be named specifically. That they're going to lead this procession of worship of the Messiah. So God has ordained them to come and to worship the Messiah in Jerusalem. That's why it's so important that we're going to start to bring them the gospel. Yeah. To let them know what their calling is. We are not afraid, friends, again, of Islam. If we really love Yeshua, there's no need to be afraid of the future. 
But we have to be very, very alert not to be deceived. There will be no peace except in and through the Messiah. And with all my heart, I wish that God is going to open our eyes that we will understand the only defeat Islam can take is through people who get opened, eyes opened for the Messiah. Can you uh, imagine the defeat of Islam if in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, instead of the Islamic worship, all this Muslim will be turned into worshippers of Yeshua? There's no bigger defeat for Islam than that. That's why this is under penalty of death. But there's no way Yeshua, he, he did start to reveal himself to Muslim. There are amazing testimony how he started to reveal himself. But the most important thing is he does that through us. We cannot, I often heard Christians say, you know, Marcel, you know, God does so many miracles among Muslims. He's going to reveal himself to them. You know, don't worry. He's going to do that. Friends, praise God when he does that. But don't fool ourselves. We shouldn't fool ourselves. The Lord has sent us to be a light to the nations. He sent us to bring out the gospel, to preach the gospel. And the Muslims in New Zealand, in Europe, in America, they are waiting to see the light in the church, to see the love. We, it will not be easy, but it was not easy for God to love us when we were his enemy. So it will not be easy for us. When you're going to do that, you need a lot of prayer. And you need to know that bringing the gospel to the Muslim will not be easy. But at the end, it's so important to know there is a heart often buried under a lot of lies. But there's a heart also longing for salvation. You know, Muslims, as soon as you start to argue with them, then there's no way. Because that's what they are trained in, to argue about doctrines, to argue about um, religious uh, belief. But something they don't know, and that's that there's a God who loves them. If we have a testimony, if we can say with all our heart that we love Yeshua because he has changed our life. And just to witness that. Not from mind to mind, but from heart to heart. That's the way these people can be touched and preached. The simple witness simple testimony and then when they open up we can really start to teach but first of all it's the testimony which is needed these people need to hear that God loves them not need to hear that they are mistaken so I realize that it's I think enough for tonight